Avalanche Studios recently rebranded their company into Avalanche Studios Group in spring of 2020. During the announcement, they unveiled a new division called Systemic Reaction. This new company will work to create other open world games. My hope is that Avalanche Studios will revisit the Mad Max universe and create a much needed upgrade in this next generation of gaming. But before taking that next step, let's take an in-depth look at the 2015 title of Mad Max. 2015 was the year of open world gaming. Many major titles flooded the market that year such as The Witcher 3, The Wild Hunt, Dying Light, Fallout 4, and Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain. The latter title competed with the new IP Mad Max, leaving it in the dust during the waning months that year. Many critics gave it mixed reviews because the game didn't have the depth of other open world titles. In my perspective, this game is a diamond in the rough and it has much potential and some rather nice gaming elements. It just needs more substance and style. This is Wes from Against the Green Gaming and this is my review for Mad Max. Many games that are movie adaptations fail as a product for many reasons. They are rushed, underdeveloped, stuck to the movie's story, and mostly just a cash grab for the publishing companies. However, even though Mad Max Fury Road came out the same year as this game, this game was a completely different entity. With that being said, Avalanche Studios took inspiration from the movies such as The Desert Wasteland by placing Max in a world with few paved roads. Most of Max's journeys will be on the sand roads. The cars also look similar to the cars in the movie, and in my opinion, it was not just done to appeal to the viewers of the movie, but it was done because I could imagine these cars roaming the hostile roads you travel. There needs an extra armor spike and other forms of protection. The rusted look helps draw the player to see that these vehicles were resurrected from scraps of the past vehicles. Finally, the game's enemy design closely resembles that of the movie. Men painted in a variety of colors, wearing protective goggles and torn up clothing to make them look comical and yet fitting in this harsh environment. The way the enemies taunt and move erratically also reminds me of the Psychos in the Borderlands series. Thankfully, the similarities stop there. The opening cinematics introduced the player to the history of how the world went through a nuclear holocaust which resulted not only in the death of nearly the entire population of people on Earth, but the ones who live were greeted with more loss and most of the Earth's water evaporated, creating a new endless desert environment for people to exist. The scenes that follow show Max roaming the wasteland in his iconic car, the Interceptor. After a few badass maneuvers and some shots from his sawed-off double-barrel shotgun, Max is outnumbered and outmatched. He is stripped of his car, gun, water, and most of his clothes. Left to die in the desert, Max miraculously recovers and tries to free his car from the clutches of Scarborough Scrotus. Nearly killing the villain, Max again is outmatched and is left to die. As if immortal, Max recovers once again this time by a dog. To me, it was a nice metaphor for every dog having its day. The canine companion leads Max to water, food, and the best character in the game, Chumbucket. This hilarious, most likely insane character helps Max by reigniting his spirits and introducing him to the religion of the Magnum Opus, a car which will be the player's main tool to lower the reign of Scrotus and his war boy's control of the Plains of Silence. Even though the story is a simple tale of revenge, it was therapeutic in a way to not have to pay attention to every conversation and choose dialogue options which would result in drastic changes to the story's direction. Don't get me wrong, that would have been nice, but I really did enjoy this blockbuster-esque story. The story doesn't drag or overstay its welcome either. It follows a linear path which will give the player 35 to over 50 hours of gameplay if the player decides to complete all the side quests and bring the Scrotus ownership to the different territories to zero. Without spoiling the ending, this one wraps up nicely. This simple story wouldn't hold a player's attention for as long as it did without some quality gameplay. For that, I am happy to say I enjoyed most of it. Most of the player's time will be spent traveling around in the magnum opus in search of scraps, the game's form of currency or resources. The scraps can then be used to upgrade the opus and Max's overall stats. Most of the scraps can be found in the Warboy's camps, which is 
mostly to protect the enemy's large supplies of oil and gasoline. In order to acquire the high quantity of scraps, the player will have to fight enemies of the camps and defeat a boss or blow up some fuel refineries. Taking down these camps was a blast due to the combat. Once Max is noticed, enemies work to surround and take turns trying to kill Max with their hands or any melee weapons they can get their hands on. For the player, Max is equipped with the most deadly punches, kicks, and devastating shells from a makeshift shotgun since he was taken. The melee combat is quick and the player will just have to use the left mouse, square button for the PS4, or X button for the Xbox controller to attack. Left mouse, triangle, or Y to parry, and spacebar, right bumper on both the PS4 and Xbox controllers to evade. The beauty of the fighting is getting the combo meter to rise up. The higher the combo meter fills, the more Max's fury meter also fills. Once the player is in fury mode, the damage is increased drastically. Moves of the enemies are a bit slower and damage dealt to the player is drastically decreased. I love getting into any hand-to-hand -to -hand combat situations. I made it my goal to try to get the largest combos possible in each fight while also taking little to no hits on Max's health. To make Max even more deadly in these combat situations is Max's upgrades. The player can equip Max with gauntlets of metal and knuckles made of large nuts and bolts. Also, the player has the choice to upgrade Max's makeshift shotgun to increase its carrying capacity and number of shells discharged with each shot. If the player allows Max to take damage, the only way to raise the health bar back to full is to drink water from his canteen or eat scraps of food such as maggots, canned dog food, lizards, and rats. As for water, the player will be in search for that substance which is located in the Warboys camps. Once the player locates a water collector, Max is able to refill a canteen and then refill his health. I enjoyed searching for these locations and made the first few hours of gameplay more gripping because Max was weak and needed only to take a few hits to kill. It was also made it more satisfying to survive a fight with upwards to 12 enemies and then find a water reserve which not only restored any lost health but also refreshed me to have Max live through the tricky situation. To make the gameplay even sweeter is the vehicles. Yes, the magnum opus is going to be the player's primary mode of transportation, but finding the hidden cars or stealing some of the war boys toys makes some nice additions to your garage. All the cars you have are stored in the garage screen in the game. I would like to have had my cars displayed in the fortresses of my allies, but I can't have everything. The really nice touch I liked, however, was the changes in each vehicle's feel. Trucks and vehicles equipped with a lift kit were top heavy and harder to control at high rates of speed. Buggies had a nice suspension system which allowed them to absorb impacts better when touching the ground from a jump or accidental fall. Those are just a few examples of the other vehicles found in this wasteland. But the most impressive vehicle is Max's magnum opus. The car itself can be upgraded to suit the player's playstyle. I liked equipping my car to have the best side ramming properties and most armor. It made the car a bit slower, but it made the larger battle so much sweeter when I was able to ram other cars and send them flying into a large ball of flaming metal and debris. Each modification the player changes impacts the overall handling, speed, and combat survivability of the Opus. It was nice to see that the developers thought about how added weight would affect the car's handling and overall performance. The Opus had a few other tricks which separated from the rest of the vehicles. With the aid of Chum Bucket, the car quickly gets two tools which help give the player the edge in combat. A harpoon is the first tool, and its ability is to pierce pieces of enemies' vehicles to pry off armor, weapons, doors, tires, and the occasional drivers from their vehicles. The satisfaction of immobilizing or even destroying the enemy's cars was so satisfying you was in the harpoon. About midway through the story, the Opus is also equipped with the Thunderpoon. Instead of firing a harpoon, Chum Bucket is able to load and fire a makeshift RPG. Once upgrading the performance of the Thunderpoon, the weapon had the power to eviscerate cars in one shot. Both the Thunderpoon and the Harpoon had other uses during my playtime. 
There are scarecrows, large statues with torches, which need to be taken down. The larger enemy fortresses also had reinforced metal doors, which needed to be opened for Max to enter and then destroy the base. There was one other tool which the player would have to Max change positions with Chum Bucket for. The Opus was equipped with a foldable sniper rifle used for taking out other snipers or enemies from afar. The nice touch is the player had control of Max and Chum Bucket at the same time. The player had the ability to move the car at a slow pace to get in range and sight of the enemy. Then the player can aim down sights to have Max fire the rifle and take out the target. Honestly, I thought all the tools felt amazing to use and fit the world they were in. They were also complemented by some great graphics. When I revisit many games which are 5 plus years old, many times I can tell the games have not aged well. Most colors just don't pop, or the lighting seems off, and the character models seems as that they have been created from clay. However, this game has aged pretty well, even when it takes place in a desert. I felt the developers did an exceptional job in some areas. Fire is the number one thing that stands out for me. Even modern games can take notes on the colors and effects Avalanche use in the lighting and visual effects department. When a car explodes, the player witnesses a lifelike array of flames engulfing the car. Even when the Opus catches on fire, the player is greeted with the flames on the sides of the screen to inform them that the car is on its last legs and needs to be repaired immediately. Nearly as impressive were the skyboxes. When traveling during day or night, I felt like the game world seemed very reminiscent of our own. There was also has to be something said about the lighting in this game. When in certain lighting conditions, this game looks nearly current gen. There are moments that seem almost photorealistic. Now, not everything aged well in this game. The character of Max still looks good, but side characters and any characters that have hair look awful. Most of the time, however, the player won't be getting too close to these characters to notice. But if they do, then we'll notice washed out colors and jagged edges around the outer parts of the character models. The hair, oh my god, the hair looks like clay which has gone through a kiln. It is stagnant and it drew me out of immersion when Max spoke to characters like Hope. Luckily the sounds of this game kept me immersed from start to finish. The thunder of the engines when creating through the desert will help give the player an idea of speed and power the variety of vehicles possess. That is complemented with the environmental sounds such as wind and fire and the inevitable dust storms. Even today, I am blown away with the incredible sounds of this game. The developers took their time to include the low bass sounds of a muscle car when it makes in the idle position. There are nice touches of the screaming of engine cars when in pursuit of the magnum opus, giving the player the feel that the mo opus is not invincible and the opponents know it. There were other subtle touches from flies buzzing around riding corpses to dry breezes of the desert. Fortunately, all the characters of this game's world made my playtime enjoyable. The voice actors did well with all the major roles. Max and Chumbucket were the two characters that stood out the most. Max's voice sounded strong and battle-hardened. It felt as if his rough past in the apocalyptic wasteland caught up with him, while Chumbucket's voice felt like a jester in a mythical world. Still, his voice fit the character well through the belief of Max becoming the savior of the wasteland with the power of the magnum opus. I was glad to visit this wasteland tale through my 40 hours of gameplay. The action and the hunt for upgrades kept me enthralled in the game's world. By the end, I wanted more to the story and was also excited that it could continue in a sequel. Even five years after this game hit store shelves, I believe it's a game which players who enjoy post-apocalyptic wastelands or games that have fighting and driving will enjoy. I give this game an 8 out of 10. It is a good game and it deserves a sequel which polishes out the rough edges and expands the Mad Max universe. Those are my thoughts on this game. I really hope you have played this game and you'll add it to your wish list if you haven't. You won't be disappointed. As for my channel, leave a like if you enjoyed watching. Also, I would love to hear what you have to say down in the comments section. 
Thanks, and until the next time, this has been Wes from Against the Green Gaming.